Uh, 40,000 people educated in the community. So that's our educators going into classrooms, libraries. We do different workshops for people. Um, we do leadership trainings. And then we also go where people really need us, like the men's prisons, Las Colinas, women's prison, uh, juvenile detention centers. We really try to go where people need us to talk about um, our bodies, to talk about birth control, to talk about menstrual health, and to talk about abortion care. And if you're interested in learning more about our work and more numbers, you can go to our annual report at plan.org slash annual report. So my department, we are C3 and C4. So we get to do a lot of community work. Uh, we manage volunteers. We have over 100 volunteers who are active in San Diego County and about 30 in Imperial County. We do um, trainings throughout the year to go over what civic engagement looks like at the local level. And then we also get people prepared to do electoral work once it's time to do uh, campaigns for the election, like the election happening this year. Uh, we also do rallies and a lot of lobbying efforts and um, advocacy sometimes for other states, depending on what's going on. It's um, a lot more frequent than how it used to be, but we have gotten involved in other states' work like Nevada, Arizona, uh, Texas. So for the purpose of this meeting, I really wanna go into some details about the Supreme Court. And I will say this, I am not a medical expert. I am not a attorney. So I'm just gonna give you like a brief overview of the upcoming decisions. And then I'll encourage you all to do more research afterwards. And I can also send some resources. I wanna talk about 2024 and how we're preparing for the election. And I also want to talk about uh, school boards, our uh, local policy initiatives, and then very briefly, constitutional amendment um, and uh, ballot measures. And um, Doug mentioned the governor's budget and the deficit. The deficit is also impacting Planned Parenthood and our health centers. So um, if that money does not happen this year, it will impact us locally, including um, how we're able to pay our staff and how we're able to pay our people. So just a heads up. So is anyone familiar with the cases right now that are talking about abortion care just by raise of hands? So these are the main two that are coming up, Mtala and if a person access. Uh, Mtala was actually, um, my understanding of it, the Biden administration sued Idaho because um, they have fetal personhood laws and they are not taking into consideration uh, EMTALA when they're um, banning people from receiving abortion care. And with EMTALA, it is a federal requirement to provide life-saving care if a patient needs it, and it does include abortion care. And Idaho is challenging the Biden administration and basically saying that fetal person fetal personhood trumps EMTALA because we have to preserve the life of the fetus. So now the Biden administration is arguing with Idaho and a, almost two dozen other states. And even uh, without the EMTALA case that's happening, there's numerous stories coming out across the country showing what doctors are having to navigate in healthcare when it comes to people who are not seeking abortions, but um, had very much wanted pregnancies uh, miscarried because it happens to like one in four of us. And now they're being turned away from hospitals and are forced to miscarry on their own without treatment, without um, pain relievers, uh, without, you know, basic empathy and care. Um, and these things are not only um, immoral and unethical, um, it's illegal. So this decision will have consequences if it is upheld by the Supreme Court. Um, and we won't really know the fate of this decision for another couple of weeks. Um, we're thinking end of June, but that's just because of precedent. I don't believe in precedent anymore. Like everything is just flying up the window these days with politics. Um, the next big one is Mifepristone access. This has also been an ongoing legal battle for the past couple of years, originating in Texas, because all good things come from Texas. And that basically is gonna go over if it should be legal and then how it could be regulated. And the latest hearings at the Supreme Court showed that the Supreme Court justices were a little um, 
I don't want to give them the benefit of the doubt, but they seemed a little skeptical to rule um, in favor of banning mifepristone because, again, it's going into very murky territory with challenging the FDA that can open a huge can of worms and uh, I imagine has way more consequences than what even the pro-life folks were intending. So these are the big two that are happening. And then not related to reproductive health, but still want to bring it up. Um, the Supreme Court is also going to be making a ruling on um, encampments and uh, if encampments um, being banned from local cities um, are legal. That's a big one because San Diego just had an encampment ban in place. And um, there's a couple other big decisions coming up, but those will have consequences for um, our community. In terms of like activations planning, uh, we are going to have a press conference and we will be inviting some community partners. We're not planning to have any rallies or protests. We will support people who are interested in having their own activations, but we simply don't have the staff to have such large work. Uh, activations, but we also want to encourage people to do their own thing. Um, we have to be behind closed doors sometimes and be on our computers and making calls. We can't always be in the streets. And that's also why we have volunteers. So um, if you are interested in those things, we will definitely support it, but we will not be leading them at this time. And we're also trying to preserve our, our efforts, our energy as well, again, for November uh, for the election. We will have a lot of campaigns to do in San Diego, Riverside, and Calexico. Uh, so a lot of work coming our way. Any questions right now about federal stuff? Yes. It can if they rule against the Comstock uh, law, yes. But um, in terms, if, if they were to uphold that, it, it would impact how we're able to distribute it here, even here. But I will say this, let's say it completely goes against um, our wishes and they have to pull it from the market. We are prepared as an affiliate to use, um, there's two abortion pills. We are prepared to use to use one of them in case Mifepristone gets taken off the market. It changes the process a bit. It can lengthen it at times. It's not perfect, but we are preparing as staff to do that if it is removed from the market. So in terms of uh, preparing for 2024, we are training people over summer to get involved with our election work and to also uh, for me, I'm in an interesting role because I am encouraging people to stay local and do things here, but I also am challenged with encouraging people from San Diego to start looking at Imperial Valley. There is a lot happening in Imperial Valley, and even though it's an hour and 45 minutes away uh, going east, um, there are a lot of um, interesting things happening in that part of the area, it is impacting people from San Diego, and most importantly, it's impacting the residents of Imperial and I don't have enough time to go over the history of Imperial Valley and um, their culture and all the things that are happening, but Lithium Valley is a thing and we're seeing it now. Um, and with that comes a lot of changes. A lot of um, political movement is happening in that area and we want to avoid displacement. We want to avoid, um, again, people being promised that a lot of money is going to come in and save the day, and then it all goes to the same people who have been running Imperial County for um, since the honestly since the day it was <laughs> born, conceived. <laughs> uh, we're also going to be doing some phone banks and canvassing throughout the year on a couple different things for some candidates, for school board work, and then also for the MCO tax. Uh, ballot measure and ACA-5 that will overturn Prop 8, which made um, uh, gay marriage illegal. And then we are planning to have things on the C3 and C4 side so that we can get all of our volunteers involved. Uh, and someone on the uh, Zoom said this earlier, but yes, school boards are in the news for all the wrong reasons these days. We are planning on getting more involved. We have gone to different school board meetings the past couple of years. We were a lot more involved with school boards um, 
almost 10 years ago because we were advocating for the California Healthy Youth Act. That is um, essentially a, a list of rights for um, the youth and adolescents in California and what they're able to do with reproductive health. Um, so now we're in a, it's not the same situation, but it's developing obviously because it's turning into attacks on gender identity, LGBTQ folks, um, race, I mean, anything remotely progressive, it's just always getting, um, uh, people are getting hurt right now and we're trying to figure out how we can get involved but also bring the community with us. We also have uh, intentions on getting training specifically for parents because if you don't go to city council, or if you don't go to the county, or if you happen to tune into those meetings, um, they look awful to me. Um, I, I don't scare easily anymore. And I still feel a little funny when I go to those spaces. So we are trying to teach people on how entering that space looks like, but also when we show up as a community in large numbers, it's less daunting, less scary. So we are planning on doing a parent academy to teach about school boards, how they work, why they're important. Uh, and really, again, it's to, pr it's to protect kids, but also what are these kids learning this is the future of our workforce, just people who will be living here and who governs them, who provides them safety and makes them feel like they belong does matter to us. Uh, this is coming up for us actually tomorrow. So I'm happy that I was able to speak tonight. So the city council is going to be voting on renewing, revising a buffer zone ordinance. And for those who are not familiar, a buffer zone is essentially an area that people are not able to encroach on. So you're not able to protest in this bubble that is blocking the entrance to a health center or an exit to a health center. It also covers K through 12 and it covers churches. So you are still allowed to protest on public sidewalks in public spaces, but let's say this is the sidewalk, this is the doorway. You can be right here and you can be right there, but you cannot be in front of the entrance. Um, and that's because of a lot of different reasons. Number one, uh, it's not fun to be a staff member and have to navigate protesters who are blocking your way, um, but also when we have more vocal protesters that are harassing our staff, harassing our patients, taking pictures of us, videos of us, blocking us from exiting the parking lots and putting signs in front of people driving cars. It's not really smart, not really safe. Um, there um, are also some new things to address um, informed consent as well. We have people passing out um, pictures of um, fetal, uh, fetal tissues and pictures of people saying you're going to die, you are in hell. And so now the buffer zone will also, um, it will try to enforce um, consent where if you are protesting, you have to ask someone who's at the health center if they want to receive the information that you are giving them. You can't just walk up to them and give them a piece of paper. You have to introduce yourself and say, can I give this to you? So it is going to encourage dialogue. And it more importantly is going to encourage people to protest safely, but away from um, blocking entrances. It gets so bad at times. We've had to shut down care and now staff can't work. Patients can't get care. And the days that they are targeting our staff and patients are the days that we have abortions. So these are also timely, important procedures. And they do that on purpose because they know when they do this, they're able to prevent someone from getting an abortion that day. Yes. Thank you. Um, this is a ordinance proposed um, just for health clinics? It's for health centers, churches, and K through 12. So areas that need more protections. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It does not apply to Target, Trader Joe's, doesn't apply to um, colleges right now, right, are having protests, doesn't apply to them either. These are considered places that are high need. Um, children need to be able to enter their building and exit. Right. Um, same. Another example I think about is that 
you can't do electioneering near polling locations. You can still be near it, right? But you have to be, what is it, 100 feet away from the polling location. It's almost the exact same thing. You don't have the buffer zone, but you have the feet limit. It's the same thing. People can still do electioneering, can still encourage people to vote, but they have to do it from a certain distance. So you can still protest, you can still sh have information, but it's from a certain distance. Um, and the language, I actually have the language pulled up and I can put it in the chat um, afterwards. Um, but it, the last time this was revised was almost 30 years ago. A lot yes. of things have changed since then, right? Uh, we had an insurrection, <laughs> we have the Supreme Court. Um, so we need to update this because our law should reflect the times that we're living in. Uh, and, and the meeting is happening tomorrow. So if you are able to join us in person, we would love that. If you would like to submit public comment virtually, you can do that. You can also send emails. Um, so any questions on this right now? Yes. folks to show up uh, tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. you, is there a place where you can get like t-shirts or something? So even if we're uh -huh. not speaking, we can be like part of a block or whatever to like show support at city council. I appreciate that. I have to see if I still have t-shirts left. Um, but even if you just have like reproductive health shirts or just anything about health that helps too. But yeah, we, we have people who are planning to speak, but we also are asking people if they support us too, to show up you know, silent protests in the chambers as well. We don't really know who's going to show up tomorrow. So, um, and we can also, yes, cede time to other people who are speaking. So yes, and there is someone in the room. I don't want to put you in the spot, but I will. Can you share your experience being a patient escort? Miss Jen? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I've been a patient escort, among other things. I always say yes to Planned Parenthood. So whatever they ask me to do, I say yes to. Um, I've been a patient escort for the last couple of years. Um, and I responded to an urgent call for help Mother's Day weekend because there was a group of over 50 protesters. Um, this is the worst I've ever seen. They followed me down the driveway when I went into the clinic. They harassed the plumber. They harassed all the de dis, um, delivery drivers. Every single patient who came in had horrible things said to them. Um, and it really, there's just no reason anyone should have to deal with that when they're going to the doctor or going to work or delivering food or doing anything. So it really... It's a reasonable restriction on speech. And the only other thing I'll say is that the people who are against us are very, very loud. And so if you can make a public comment either online or show up um, to do so, it really does matter. Uh, and with that being said, um, the, the foot limit right now is you have to be at least eight feet from the patient entering the premises. Um, it originally was 15 feet, but then the Supreme Court um, did strike that down. And um, they could even strike this one down too. Um, but so far, no one has filed any suits. So we are hoping this does pass. We are hoping it's not legally challenged. But again, this is to have a buffer um, and to also, you know, it's very uncomfortable to go to Planned Parenthood and not be able to get into the building. I navigate that going to all central all the time. And it doesn't help that a crisis pregnancy center is now right next door to our health center. Um, so they're always uh, there when I show up for my shifts and uh, it's not comfortable. All right. Couple more things. If you are running for office or know someone running for office, we will be doing endorsements over summer. So you can email endorsements at plan.org. The endorsements are done by our board um, and not by staff. So um, the decisions are made at the board level, but you can always email staff if you are interested in, in getting an endorsement and we will pass along your information to um, our board. So again, uh, the health center fire that we had in El Centro, um, if you want to learn more about it or support it, you can go to plan.org slash fire relief. Um, really excited that it's opening because it is very critical for us to be there. We are the only abortion provider in um, Imperial County, but we also are the closest abortion provider for a lot of out-of-state patients as well. There's a lot of back and forth with the laws in Arizona right now. All the Arizona patients go to El Centro or they go to uh, Riverside where our health centers are. So when we had to close down 
temporarily it did impact patient care and we had to na re navigate people and get them to other places. Um, so even though this is a, a local health center for um, our affiliate, it does actually serve a lot of people across the country because of the abortion bans that we're facing as a nation. So I'm done now. If you want to support us or learn more about us, you can also fo fo uh, follow us on social media. If you're interested in our school board work and learning more about our sex ed work, um, you can go to sex ed to go. You can also just find all this on our website, plan.org. Um, really, my main ask when I go to meetings like this is that you do get involved or find a way to get involved. So I really do appreciate you, Kathy, for thinking of me um, and inviting me to speak. We really do need help. I know that um, there still is this trope that we're in California and things are going well for us. And in a lot of ways they are, but then I see gas, I see the price of eggs. Things are still very tricky here. Um, but even when it comes to the topic of abortion and reproductive rights, we have numerous Planned Parenthoods and other health centers that are navigating their own bans. Fontana is not able to operate a Planned Parenthood because their city council keeps getting involved. So now the city of Fontana is being sued. Um, for pretty much breaking Prop 1, which we fought very hard to have. And everyone said, what's the point of Prop 1? Because Fontana is not following the law. Um, Beverly Hills um, had attempted to open an abortion clinic. It got shut down by an outside group from D.C. Um, we've had issues with health centers in our own affiliate, including with fire chiefs not wanting to issue us permits because of doorways. And then we had to sue and then all of a sudden the doorway is fine the next day. So my message is to um, really get local and this idea of it's all good here, throw that out. Um, we really have to remain focused and come together um, because we have a lot of groups that are attacking abortion rights, that same people who are attacking LGBTQ rights and um, all the stuff with the school boards, all the attacks, um, does not originate from Mississippi or Alabama. It originates in Orange County, in Riverside County, in Temecula. So the problem might look like it's bad over there in other places, but it's happening here. The work is happening here. So I wanna encourage everyone in this room to think about what advocating at the local level looks like because we really do need it right now. Yes. Yeah, got all, I'm not saying you've got all the answers, yeah. but I'm, I would assume organizations like Planned Parenthood have yeah. something in mind. I mean, yeah. it's just so it's just so scary. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it's. I mean, if that happens, that's uh, probably much worse than 2016 happening. I would say the one thing that we do know for sure, uh, Republicans would come after would be uh, a national abortion ban. So I would say we have to mobilize to fight as hard as we can against that, because if they do have enough people in the legislator to pass that, um, they will. And yes, that would essentially make abortion illegal in all 50 states if that happens. So I would say if he, if he does win, um, may God help us, but also we can't, we can't cry and throw in the towel. We have to come together, hopefully in spaces like this, but the work keeps going. We, we've been in some pretty dark places and majority of the country does believe in people's right to choose Kansas, right? Florida's about to do it. Arizona's trying to do it, but the data overwhelmingly shows people are in favor of reproductive rights, even Imperial County. People always joke about us not being wanted there, but when we literally, quite literally burnt down, people who don't support us were calling us saying how sorry they were, but also their people, their family members had to go somewhere else to get health care. And that county voted 54% in favor of Prop 1. So all this shit about people not supporting us, the math ain't mathin. So people do support Planned Parenthood, people do support reproductive rights and abortion. And um, we have to remind people that. Any more questions? Doug. What is a sex ed to go? Sex ed to go are um, micro learning videos on different sex ed topics. So we talk about um, healthy bodies, consent, birth control. And then we have a specific curriculum for youth, 
Um, and then it's age appropriate content if you're eight years old or 12 years old or 16 years old. And then we have videos specifically for teachers. And then we have videos specifically for parents on all these topics. And we are expanding every couple months. We're hoping to have every major reproductive health topic on that website, but there are 10, 15, 30 minute videos on all these topics. And uh, I do encourage you all to watch them. They're, they're pretty interesting, but also relatively quick. Yes. Um, I just want to acknowledge your work on behalf of so many homeless people because Planned Parenthood provides health services to people who are unsheltered. And um, because they often lack access to restrooms, you and I met actually yes. at a discussion. Yes, so um, thank you for that. And uh, you know, there's so much more to Planned Parenthood than reproductive health care and abortion mm -hmm. services. And maybe you could just quickly summarize. A yeah, bit. I really appreciate you saying that. And I always appreciate seeing you. Um, we do a lot of coalition building, which looks kind of funny when we're in the room because they're like, why is Planned Parenthood here? You're talking about transit today. Uh, we are really looking at the issues that are impacting the health centers and our patients. In Imperial County, we are working on a transit campaign to increase the number of bus routes because people can't get to basic places and it's very hot. Uh, it, was a, it got to 100 degrees according to the car I was in uh, earlier today. Um, water, access to public bathrooms, um, not a hot topic for a lot of people, but if you got to go and you can't go, you're going to have a very bad day. And if you're homeless, uh, you can have a very bad day in jail if you get caught um, going um, out in public. But we do, we try to, we try to go into other territories and we're not always the lead. And I will say that um, there are some places where we just need to go and listen and learn. And then there are places where we do want to take up space, but we are trying to be a resource for people in the community. Um, if I could have like two more staff members, we would just be everywhere, but I'm limited. But we do have a lot of local campaigns that are addressing menstrual health. The county finally reached their milestone of um, stocking every single county owned facility with a free menstrual product vending machine. That's because of what we did in 2020 with Youth Will. We asked for a pilot and a permanent program for free menstrual products. They said, we don't do that. And now all of a sudden, and they said that we can do that. And now they are. There's a thousand vending machines in 300 locations in, in San Diego County. Still having issues with the bathrooms because I was told that bathrooms are not important. We need to um, build housing this year. We're going to get it done this year. Uh, so yeah, I'm hoping people will start to wake up to that, but we are a part of a, another coalition slash research team. The Project for Sanitation Justice is an SDSU-led team uh, of researchers who are looking into uh, ways to promote access to resources that allow us to take care of our bodies, shower stalls, public bathrooms, clean drinking water, um, but even just having a standard of what a public bathroom should be because believe it or not there actually aren't any standards but there are standards for the homes that you live in if your toilet breaks down today and you're a renter your landlord your property manager has to address that otherwise there's some financial penalties if that doesn't get fixed if this restaurant's bathroom shuts down and floods and is dirty they cannot operate their kitchen why don't we offer this and do this for public places and why do we take off doorways, doors and uh, uh, take off locks from bathroom stalls? So uh, it's not that controversial to me, but I've been told it's not a priority because you can just go to Starbucks. Uh, but it negates the whole thing with if you're unhoused, you can't go to Starbucks, you don't have money to buy coffee. So yeah, we try to do other policy work um, items. So if you also have something interesting, I'm always open to hearing it. Doesn't have to be related to reproductive health, but if it's related to public health, that's where we can start doing work together. Anybody else have a question before we? Well, thank you so much, Judy, for joining us tonight. We really appreciate your time and everything that you do. Um, 
from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you. <laughs> All right. We have um, another section to our program tonight. We're going to talk about the city budget and the cuts to the equity funding. And we have with us Sonia Robinson. She's the resolution specialist and she's on the Zoom with us today. So we're gonna pull her up here. There she is. Go ahead, Sonia. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, um, Kathy, and to all of the members and participants with the Democratic Women's Club here in the County of San Diego. It is definitely an honor to speak with you all, as well as I am very humbly uh, appreciative of the support you all have rendered on this topic, specifically addressing the Climate Equity Fund. So I would like to start off our conversation uh, normally, I, I also uh, put a link to my um, YouTube for those that's um, online or virtually as well. Um, I, I I also do a, a podcast show addressing the intersectionality of environmental and climate justice uh, with social and racial justice. And I start off with a, a quote, and I thought this is very appropriate for this audience for the Democratic Women's Club. And a quote states, the success of every woman should be the inspiration to another. We should raise each other up, make sure you're very courageous, be strong, be extremely kind, and above all, be humble. And that's Serena Williams. And so again, that's just a reflection of how I felt on all of the support we received on this particular subject matter. And I hope that I have um, screen access. Um, right now is disabled, but once I do get screen access, I would like to pull up um, a few items, specifically the ordinance that is under discussion from the City of San Diego's um, franchise agreement for the Climate Equity Fund. And if I don't get access, oh, look like you guys that provide me access. Thank you so much. So this particular ordinance here, um, as you can see here, is the Resolution 313454. It was passed unanimously back in March of um, 2021. And this was a result of the city's negotiations with SDG&E with their franchise agreement. And so this was a resolution that is now a city ordinance that is related to the climate equity index that specifically does, I'm going to go back real quick here and just um, read a couple um, statements from this ordinance to put things in um, perspective. It says, whereas the climate equity index assess census tracts in the city using standardized indicators, including environmental, social, economic, housing, mobility, and health indicators to calculate the climate equity index from zero to, oh, excuse me, I just scanned too quick for myself, uh, from 100 for each track that could be compared to the scores of other tracks. And so below, it also kind of really highlights um, the purpose of this is to make our communities more resilient. So you see here, it says between zero and 60 on the climate equity index to be more resilient and adapt to climate change. So this particular, um, this particular um, resolution is something that the city is, this particular ordinance, excuse me, or climate equity fund is being funded specifically directly from sdg and &E. And right now this, um, this fund is at $8.5 million. And so we are all very much aware of the continuous gaps in need of the families and those that are those flood impacted families from the flood that took place um, in January. And so this fund very well could be used to address this. So here we have here, we're in the middle of the or the beginning here of this ordinance. It says, whereas California passed Senate Bill SB 100 or SB 1000 in 2016, which requires cities and counties to add an environmental justice element or update the environmental justice policies in their general plan. An environmental justice element should intend to reduce the unique or compounded health risk in disadvantaged communities, promote civic engagement in the public decision-making process 
and prioritize improvements and programs that address the needs of disadvantaged um, communities. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing that for the moment. And then I'm also going to pull up currently our, um, give me one second, the City of San Diego's Environmental Committee Work Plan for 2024, just to see the correlation as is addressing um, climate or environmental justice. So this is from February of this year, of 2024. And I'm gonna scroll through here to show the core principles. And here in the core principles, it address advanced ambitious climate goals, lead with equity, acknowledge past harm and need for environmental justice, ensure transparency and promote inclusion, ensure high quality job standards while expanding a skilled and trained workforce for a green economy, partner with government agencies and community organizations to improve strategies and leverage resources. Again, this climate equity fund is a resource. It is $8.5 million and it is being funded directly from sdg and &E. It's not something that us as ratepayers are paying. We are also very well aware that many sdg and &E customers experience what we call energy burden, meaning they pay more for their energy bill um, in ratio to the amount of income that they have. And so this climate equity fund is actually something positive that our community members should be able to leverage to mitigate the needs that they have related to the um, to the flood. So another, um, if I can get, get it pulled up, give me one second, I don't have it up on my screen. I also want to share the outpour of support that was recently rendered by um, many of you groups and organizations as I express my initial gratification or, or support um, from you all with a Democratic Women's Club, as well as over 50 organizations that signed on to this, that, that, that signed on to this letter addressing our mayor, as well as our city council members. So just want to um, highlight you all here in the beginning. So all of these groups and organizations, and the beauty of all this is that there's groups and organizations that are coming together across social economic status, across group, across neighborhoods and city districts that all are standing in, standing together in, um, in solidarity to support our mayor to fund our climate equity fund because his initial proposal defund the Climate Equity Fund, which has a balance of 8.5 million. Now, most recently, he, um, I believe that 1.5, and we'll go ahead and um, reduce this letter right now, 1.1, excuse me, 1.1 million was returned back to the Climate Equity Fund. So we're asking not only for the Climate Equity Fund, but for all of the equity programs to be Funded. And I strongly encourage you all to contact your council members, contact the mayor's office, and to give your public comments during, whether it's non-agenda um, public comments during the city council's meeting, as well as participate in the budget hearing that is currently underway. Now, one of the uh, resources for a call to action that I would like to provide you all is actually um, our city's environmental committee is meeting this Thursday. You got muted, Sonia. We, you dropped off at this Thursday. <laughs> okay. I might've did that myself on accident, um, but thank you for letting me know, Kathy. So I am, um, I'm putting this, um, Agenda item, which is agenda item 12, and it's SDG and Needs presentation on climate equity. That is occurring this Thursday for the city's environment committee. So I would strongly encourage you all to attend that meeting and provide public comments. I just put the meeting link link in the chat as well. And so 
for a, a particular um, action item. Now I'll pull this letter up and I also want to say that I don't have all the main, you know, most updated items, but I will say this advocacy has been working because I'm going to um, scroll down and show you all of the equity programs that was not funded for the fiscal year 2025, which was the Climate Equity Fund, the After School Programs, the Office of Child and Youth um, Success Programming, the Youth Drop-In Centers, the Eviction Prevention Program, the Eviction Notice Registry, the Community Equity Fund and the Office of Race and Equity, the Cannabis Equity Equity Program, San Diego's Access for All Digital Equity Program, the Library Staff, Office of Immigrant, Immigrant Affairs, Community Projects, Programs, and Services. As of what I know now, and I may not have the most updated information, I believe the Office of Immigrant Affairs has not been funded, but the Digital Equity Program has been funded. The Library Staff have, has been extended. Also, I think the um, Canada's Cannabis Equity Program is not funded either. Um, the eviction notice registry is back into the budget. The eviction prevention program is back into the budget. The youth drop-in centers is back into the budget. And again, like I mentioned before, the equity, the climate equity fund is now funded at 1.1 million, but no dollar or cents should be taken away from the families that actually need it and why this ordinance was actually created. And that is to make the communities more resilient that have less resources. And they normally represent the diverse communities here in the city of San Diego, which are the city districts four, eight, and nine. This advocacy work is um, help, is working, like, like I said, because all of you that have signed on to this letter and others that have just participated in giving your um, public comments, a lot of the programs that were not funded initially are now being funded, but there's still work to do. And again, I strongly encourage you all to contact your council members, your mayor, and to participate in the budget hearing, to give your public comments, and to attend the Environment Committee this Thursday at 1 p.m. and make sure that your voice is also heard for and, and to frankly demand that our Climate Equity Fund is fully funded for the purpose in which it was intended and voted for back in 2021. And I'm willing to take any questions if there are any. Questions, anybody? I had a question. So I went to the city council meeting when this budget was first introduced and I believe there were 181 public speakers. Is that correct? 180? for the first one on May 1st. Is that yeah. what you're referring to on May yeah. 1st? Kathy? Yeah, that was a, a, I mean, it was a, an, if you were there, it was, I think you were now kind of reflecting in my memory. It was an amazing show of representation for our community. I know that we had some community strategy meetings and we decided to reach out as much as we can to our, our community and to get people to show up. And they did, They had, if you remember, they had a clear request for the aisles to be cleared out several times throughout that evening budget hearing because so many people were there and we all also wore black as representation and solidarity. Many of us, not everyone that was there, but many of us did. And it was, I heard comments from many people speaking how powerful it was and, um, and hopefully very impactful, so. Right, and when you go to the city council meeting, it can sound scary, but you, if you don't wanna speak, you can cede your time to someone else like Sonia who has her points all prepared and is ready to go. And that gives her an additional minute to speak. So it's a system where if you're, if you're going, you can be there just to show your body is there. You can also give your time to someone else to speak. It's not as scary as it seems. So thank you so much, Sonia, for being with us. And I'm glad to hear that it's working and that some of the things have gotten funded. So that's yeah. great news. And I do have an action for us tonight. I have postcards that are already pre-addressed to the city council. So you can take two of these, one for your city council person and one for your mayor. And on the back of the agenda is your city council districts broken down by zip code. So if you're not sure who your representative is, you can turn the agenda over and find out right now who you should write your postcard to. 
And uh, that's what we're going to do tonight and try to get some postcards uh, to the city council members. That's awesome. Thank you. So let's just take two and pass them down. And I have stamps for these. So after you've written them, I will collect them, stamp them, and we'll send them to City Hall. Also, um, John, I gave some talking points to you. So we're going to put up a slide of talking points. If you're not sure what you should write, you could just use one of these phrases out of these, or you could write the whole thing. And when you get your postcards, please feel free to do that. Then I'll collect them afterwards because I do have stamps. All right. So we are going to move on to our agenda, which is, I need my glasses, Hannah. <laughs> All right. Pop up postcarding, that's where we are right now. So next on the agenda is our East Area Club Associate election. I am thrilled to announce that we have reached 20 members in the East Area, which entitles us to an additional club associate at Central Committee. So if you live in the East County and you would like to go to two more meetings a month, I know that sounds awesome, but you get to vote at the area meeting and then you can attend the central committee meeting as a club associate. Your vote is important in the East area. And I don't know who to, if we have anyone in the East area that lives in East that would like to be our club associate at central committee. I don't see any hands. Do we have anyone on the zoom that would like to be our East? Okay, area? Kathy, I'll do it. <laughs> I think I hear Susan Pinato. Yeah, if nobody else will do it, I'll do it. All right. Susan lives on Mount Helix. She's in the East area. And um, let's just take a quick vote. All in favor of Susan Pinato being our club associate in the East area, please say aye. Thank you. Any opposed? Seeing none, it is unanimous. Thank you so much, Susan. What have I done? <laughs> <laughs> Two more meetings a month. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> We appreciate you though. And I'm also happy to announce that um, in the North County Coastal, we are just two members away from getting a club associate in the North County Coastal. So I'm excited about that. If you live in North County Coastal and you have friends or neighbors, please encourage them to join so we can get another rep. Next on the agenda, we have Mandy. Mandy is gonna talk about our upcoming endorsement meeting. Might need to turn it on. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Kathy stated, our next round of endorsements is going to be coming up on Sunday, June 2nd. Um, it will all be um, via Zoom. And so uh, the meeting link has been sent out along with the notice. We have about 15 races to consider. Um, please remember to pre-register and Take this time to research as we begin to receive the completed questionnaires from these candidates. We'll be sure to share those with club members. But again, I encourage you all to do your um, adequate research on all of these candidates to ensure that we're endorsing the best candidates. Um, but again, we look forward to your participation. Save the date. It's Sunday, June 2nd, from uh, starting up at 11 a.m. Thank you. Yeah, and a, just a couple of questions that I've already heard about endorsements. You will be receiving a ballot, which means you don't necessarily need to attend the meeting if you already know who you're voting. Go ahead, Mandy. And I have another uh, friendly announcement regarding the uh, endorsement meetings. I just want to reiterate the um, importance of privacy and respect. We did have an incident that was reported back to us by a fellow club member Um stating that their comments were repeated back to a third party and there's some, you know, impacts that have um, to their life. And I want to, again, just ask that we all be mindful of that and, and be, uh, hold those conversations in the highest esteem and make sure that we keep those confidential and not repeat those or, or, or tie those comments to individual people. Um, 
from those proceedings. So I just want to, again, let all of our club members know that we want to respect everyone's privacy. Thank you. Absolutely. And, you know, we can talk about what happens in the endorsement meeting without using names at the very least to keep people's uh, privacy confidential. All right. Next up on the agenda, we have business unfinished or new. Did you want to say something, Rachel? No? Oh. Well, we have, in, in past meetings, we have talked about um, California Women's List and their her stories report, and I think we can follow up with something from you, if you don't mind. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Rachel Locke, and I work at the University of San Diego. I direct the Violence, Inequality, and Power Lab there. This is year two of research that we've been doing, um, mapping the universe of threats and harassment directed towards local elected officials. We started last year in San Diego County. Um, this year we are doing San Diego County, Imperial and Riverside counties. Uh, it will not be surprising to know that our findings are, I think last year it was um, 70, 75% of all surveyed elected officials had received threats and harassment, half of those on a monthly basis. Um, this year, our findings are interesting. They track with last year. One interesting finding, however, is that um, threats and harassment towards women has actually come down a little bit. Uh, we're not quite sure why. Um, that is true across the country, too. There is an equalizing uh, between men and women, and we're not quite sure why that is. It might be part of a normalization process. Um, there's lots of hypotheses. Um, we are finishing, we finished our data collection for this year. I think we have two interviews remaining, probably. Um, we'll be doing a series of what we call community conversations, where we'll share the findings of our research, the first is next Tuesday uh, at the Coronado Public Library from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. So if anyone is interested, please come. Um, uh, if you want to know more details, you can always email me for information about that. We are also planning to have one in North County that we're organizing, I believe, with the, women, the League of Women's Voters in North County, one in East County. Um, that is not currently have a co-host. So if anyone's interested in supporting one in East County, we're also doing one in Riverside um, with UC Riverside, probably in late June. Um, and we are always willing to share the results of our research. I'm happy to come and present the results here if it would be interesting or anywhere else. We're happy to share the results of the research. Thank you so much. Of course, we would be interested in that very much, very much so. Lori? I thank you. I actually wanted to suggest as part of our endorsement process that we ask candidates um, if they are um, taking any harassment prevention positions, if they've had training, if, excuse me, if they're having their staff do harassment prevention, because sometimes this prevention comes from other campaigns and elections directed at an opponent. So I think, and I've made this recommendation at Central Committee as well, that they add a standard question to all endorsement questionnaires if a candidate has completed harassment prevention. Um, and I, I think it is, we need to elevate this conversation about keeping this from do, happening. Do you know of any harassment training? Uh, yes, there, it's available online. I can, I don't know who the best person to share that with, but yeah. I can get a... Uh, you know, I would be open to that recommendation, especially just, you know, in the climate that we live in currently as women um, to add that we have sent the questionnaires out to the candidates, but I, I would be okay with adding that as a bonus question to get um, clarity on from our candidate. Or we could ask the candidates during their, when, when they, yeah. But I think it's important to have a resource to point them to if the training does exist already, which I'm glad to hear it does. Any other unfinished or new business tonight? All right, we're gonna go on to officer reports. My president's report is as always, please download our mobile app, wherever you get your apps. You wanna search DWC of SD, 
and download our mobile app. You'll have all of our meeting minutes, agendas, uh, notices, updates, everything right at your fingertips. And now on to our vice presidents. Andrea, do you have a report? Nothing from Andrea. Susan Panato on Zoom, our external Absolutely. vice president. Yeah, I, I have three things. Um, one of them is I'd like to I put just put in the chat um, the link to a uh, to a fundraiser that um, Rosamond Blevins and I are having um, uh, for Lachey uh, for our endorsed candidate uh, Lachey uh, Sharp Collins, who's running for assembly. He's running for the seat that uh, Kiva Weber had. And it's Sunday, May the 26th at 2 p.m. Uh, at Rosamond's home, which is um, in the historic area of Mount Nebo in, in La Mesa. Uh, so we would we really encourage support. She's going to need our support. Um, so please take down the link or Kathy will send it out. Now, the next thing I have to say is that we... Um, Kathy and I, uh, for the last couple of years, have been submitting to the Moxie Theater um, um, candidates for, um, to, for their Moxie Awards. And for those of you who don't know what the Moxie Theater is, it's an all-female-run um, theater, and it, and it has uh, the directors are, are, are female, and it focuses on uh, uh, highlighting women and women, plays about women and women writers. So this year we have had, okay, let's go in the past. Uh, Kathy um, nominated um, um, Sarah, Jacobs. Uh, Sarah Jacobs, and who's the other? I forgot. I'm just totally blitzing. Um, Genevieve uh, Jones Wright. And keep going, keep going. Who else? Is it? Kathy, yes, Kathy's been more successful than me. Well, this year, I had um, a successful um, su uh, submission, and she's sitting in the room with you right now. And she happens to be our um, internal VP, um, Dr. Andrea Kubert. So let's um, let's. I'm, we're really excited. I'm really excited about this. Um, so as a um, club, um, we can um, support her by going to the Moxie Theater. And I believe um, the date, I had the date, I had it up here and I can't find it's it. June now. 2nd in the evening. Thank you, Kathy. June the 2nd. And um, and I, 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 we may have another one. I don't, haven't had confirmation yet. So I just won't say anything about that. But um, that's really exciting that we have, have that many. And I want to, uh, let's clap for um, Dr. Kubit. That's mm -hmm. Andrea. We just give her a good applause. Um, the other thing is, um, I just want to make sure, uh, thank Rachel for, Rachel Locke for coming, um, and make sure that Lori and Rachel connect. Okay, thanks. It. That's, I'm done. Bye. All right. Thank you, Susan. And thank you for nominating Dr. Cupid. That was brilliant. And so glad she's being honored. Hannah, do you have anything? Nothing from Hannah. Beatrice, our treasurer. At the moment, we have um, a balance of about three and a half thousand in the bank account. Let me let Pat do that. All right. Thank you. Our woman of few words. Do, do you know how many members we have? Um, 119? 116. 116 members, and like I said, we only need two more in North County Coastal to be entitled to another um, associate. Uh, on Zoom, do we have Elise Pipkin Allen? And does she want to say anything to us? Yes, hello all. It was a great meeting, Kathy. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, well, that was short and sweet. Wonderful. All right, so now we are to announcements. Anybody have any announcements they would like to share with the group? No announcements, that's, that's a first. Okay. 
I'll have one announcement. Susan pressed buttons for uh, Dr. Lachey. So if you'd like to get a campaign button on your way out, there's plenty of those. She is our endorsed candidate and we're gonna work hard and try to get her elected. If there is nothing else, we have reached the end of our agenda and I call this meeting adjourned. Oh, thank you, Hannah. <laughs> Take care, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for coming, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye, Susan. Thanks for logging on. Bye, Susan. Bye, Bye all. Bye, everybody. <laughs>